So hello everyone and welcome to the UCL lunch hour lecture on the future of global health systems. I'm Professor Judy Davies, Director of the MBA Health in the Global Business School for Health, GBSH at UCL. And as you probably know, UCL is opening its state-of-the-art campus, UCL East, in September. So this lunch hour lecture series brings together some great speakers to discuss some of the research that will be taking place at our UCL East campus in the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. So I'm very pleased today to introduce our two speakers. They're Professor Nora Colton and Professor Julene Scordis. So Professor Nora Colton is director of the UCL Global Business School for Health. She's a health and development economist with extensive experience in change management and strategy. Nora has received several grants to conduct field work in the Middle East, and she's the author of numerous journal articles concerned with Middle Eastern economics and politics. Professor Colton is also co-author of a book with Elsevier Press entitled Middle East Finance, Missed Opportunities or Future Prospects, and she has a forthcoming book with Palgrave Macmillan on the political economy of Yemen. Nora conducts research, teaches and publishes on healthcare management and strategic leadership in healthcare. Our second speaker is Professor Jolene Scordis, who is Director, Deputy Director of UCL's Institute for Global Health and Director of UCL's Center for Global Health Economics. Professor Scordis has published in high impact journals and her work has directly influenced government policy she works with a wide range of organizations, including the World Bank, WHO, national governments, and international NGOs. So the format is that each speaker will talk for around 15 minutes, and then we'll have uh, some time at the end for questions. So these can be submitted at any point during the talk by going to the Slido um, on your internet browser and entering the event code, hashtag UCL trial. So now I'm very pleased to hand over to our first speaker, uh, Professor Nora Colton. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to really speak to you about a, a, a very important topic and that's really is the future of global health systems. So as we've seen over the, the past several years, uh, we, we really witnessed uh, lots of changes in, in health and healthcare. But moreover, we've seen the weaknesses of, uh, of healthcare systems. And alongside coping with the pandemic, we have seen the failure to address climate change, uh, the global prevalence of non-communicable diseases, inadequate access to healthcare services, and, and, and moreover, uh, the lack of health workers globally. And it's in a very important and, and, uh, issue today. So all of this really requires good global governance systems to manage effectively. And we've also seen that there's been a need to drive forward changes in healthcare. And so we're seeing more medical and health technology, more emphasis on preventative medicine and patients taking more responsibility for their healthcare. And all of these are positive, but again, they need to be done not just at a, a local national level, but, but global governance system. So in spite of all of these changes uh, and questions, there remains still uh, questions around the effectiveness of global health governance. And, and it's not new. Each time we have a health crisis, uh, these kinds of health and global health governance issues are highlighted. So we still need better global co cooperation and global institutions and rules and, and really collective action if we're gonna meet future health challenges. We also are seeing that uh, as the health ecosystem evolves, the stakeholders who make up our global uh, health community has changed. And although the World Health Organization remains important, there are also lots of new influencers, uh, things like philanthropists and new types of health organizations emerging. We also see a uh, legal environment changing, and public-private partnerships, and financial markets, and intergovernmental organizations, and, as well as charities and, and non-governmental organizations. So although it's great and, and, and the increase in actors uh, is welcome, the various groups contribute to this newly emerging kind of global health system, it's creating a much more complex health ecosystem. 
And if it's not united, it could fall victim to old governance structures. So our current global health governance systems may actually end up failing to prevent health crises becoming a global danger if they're not considered in this wider kind of health players. And, and they also, that our existing organizations get the cooperation, trust, and coordination at the, the national as well as the global level. So today, what I'd like to do is just focus uh, our attention on the global setting and, and really look at it in terms of what does it mean for the future of our global health? And I believe that there are really two views that are emerging. One is particularly around organizations such as the WHO, uh, really that was created and, and has been fostered in the aftermath of World War II and was really created to really drive better cooperation in terms of health. And then a, another kind of an emerging a narrative that is really around a much more kind of nationalistic perspective that somehow these organizations and global cooperation has failed. And so we need to, to kind of have more uh, nationalistic approaches to, to health and healthcare. So really, as I've just illustrated, we've seen an un unprecedented uh, disruption on our global health systems, um, particularly with, with the pandemic and, and the fighting of, of not just the, 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 you know, the, the pandemic, but supporting health workers and delivering care. And uh, this has really created a lot of uh, challenges around access and safety. And, and of course, as we all know, supply chain logistics, as well as financial stresses that uh, need to be solved in different ways. But what we don't wanna have come out of the pandemic and we see is, is an, a new excuse for nationalism, isolationism. Uh, we've seen anti-immigration policies and institutionalized racism. So we are already starting to see some of this and all, all of this could increase inequalities that, that really plague global health and further concentrate power into the hands of, of, of the elite within in the global health system and, and the global uh, economy. So what we need really, and what we're seeing is issues uh, that are really you know, emerging and emerged through COVID across the landscape, things like the lack of equipment and supplies to test for, for COVID-19, as well as the, the vaccine unequal distribution and, and hoarding of vaccines. And this has really, uh, the response was a surge in nationalism with respect to the need to, to pr produce pharmaceuticals, medical supplies, equipment, um, even countries that traditionally had not, no capacity in this area started exploring how, how they could, could get into manufacturing. So that response uh, you know, really didn't start in, in 22. It's been maturing for a number of years, and actually, I, I would argue over the past decade. And really, the WHO is the only global organization with a mission, reach, and infrastructure suitable to addressing many of the global health system issues that are emerging. But the WHO has evolved into an organization that's actually less powerful today than it was when it was created. And that's because the financial pressures uh, from having uh, to cut its budget and an expanding world and its membership funding model have not left it powerful enough or independent enough in this international, even though it's, it, it's got the capacities around international health regulation uh, to make kind of decisive decisions in health emergencies. And we see that the WHO has incredible expertise in scientific areas, epidemiology, medicine, but its leadership is, is constrained in a world where the rise of geopolitical tensions are more defining. And we've particularly seen that uh, through the pandemic. So the WHO has authority to take actions and, and can challenge how governments exercise sovereignty in health emergencies, as well as travel restrictions. But through the pandemic, they were unable to really exercise effectively that authority. And, and that really goes back to over the past decade. Uh, we have seen that the need for better health and health care cooperation in a world more independent has been there, but this interdependent world has created a tension around 
trade and political beliefs that actually have been working against cooperation in, in terms of global health. Um, many of the issues with the, the WHO have to do with the state of then the global political economy. And I think it really offers a foreshadowing of what might happen again if there's not reforms, not just to the WHO, but really to the global system uh, and the political system and how states interact. So throughout the pandemic, we've witnessed the WH members actually undermining the organization by their kind of clear lack of confidence or self-regulating policies around the vaccines, travel restrictions, isolation policies. And the WHO has also been placed in, in, in a very uncomfortable position where its credibility and authority ha have been questioned, um, where it's had to focus more on its technical expertise in, in, in particularly in, in the face of challenges from different kind of superpower uh, governments. So I, I would argue that we are in a kind of a new era in terms of global health system, where many countries uh, advocate a sovereign perspective that has really a low tolerance for any kind of WHO criticism or authority, which then makes all of us very vulnerable. And the WHO has been placed in a situation of taking a, a kind of a non-confrontational approach to try to continue to have influence, particularly in those technical areas. They are really extremely challenged to demonstrate healthcare leadership in a world where it must uh, be concerned and concern itself with kind of different political perspectives. It's, it's really walking a, a tightrope to really drive forward health reforms and guidance. And uh, I, I believe that we, what we need is really a more independent WHO. Um, and, and we need the states to, to respect the kind of will of the WHO so that it can really do what's in the best interest of populations. But I think the kind of current global political and economic uh, situation we, we now find ourselves in doesn't really bode well for uh, global health cooperation. And, and I think that's really alarming and something that we all should be concerned about. And uh, even though the pandemic uh, has made vivid really the need for really high quality and accessible health systems, and even though the world, and, and we hear so much talk about the focus on the global development goals, and, and particularly the global, uh, the sustainable development goal number three, uh, and we all really want to have better and more focused cooperation, I think in terms of health professionals and health systems, it is in a contentious environment. And so the COVID-19 has implied longstanding systems and kind of structural problems. Um, and, and many of those we, we focus on in terms of global health, we think about inequalities such as poverty and access to healthcare, but it's also about the, the health system itself and, and, and the broader context in which it sits in and the ability uh, of the system. And, and as we see it through the WHO um, and, and their inability to really influence governments and geopolitical situations that, that tend to be advocating a much more nationalistic or sovereign kind of perspective. So citizens really across the globe are very concerned about health. And many of them are very angry and tolerant about the health injustices they see. But their inability to kind of influence those geopolitical uh, you know, issues that, that are seen at the, the national and economic level, I think really compromise uh, the ability uh, to really hear those voices. So I really believe that we're uh, at a, a point where the, the, the global political economy, which is increasingly fragile, is um, in, in danger of shaping our kind of societal uh, perspective on uh, global health systems. And that we're, we might be in danger of, of capturing that nationalism as we try to find solutions to, to global health. Um, which would not lead to the kind of multilateral cooperation that's going to be essential. So I'm really hopeful that citizens uh, across the globe can really unite 
through these wider kind of stakeholder organizations so that we can all start to appreciate the, the risks of not cooperating, um, that uh, we can learn lessons from the pandemic and that the, the need for cooperation to really drive forward new models of health across systems uh, we need to recognize that all these stakeholders and actors and, and need to really combine with the WHO to really work for a kind of global level to ensure that um, governments respond in an appropriate way and recognize the unique kind of landscape uh, of the kind of health ecosystem. So thank you. That's great very much. So now we move over to uh, Professor Jolene Scordis. Thank you very much, Nora. I'm um, going to share my screen. I only have three slides to share with you today. Um, that should be showing on your screens now. Um, I think it's really important that Nora has started us off both with a broad sweep of where we're at post pandemic, but also with some warning shots about the dangers of, sort of hyper sovereignty and isolation. Uh, because I was going to talk you through five key trends that I think are important for us to note as we think about the future of global health systems. Um, and then I'll lay, out, um, I'll lay out what opportunities we might grasp. So while on the one hand we have increasing tendencies towards sovereignty, national systems, isolationist, nation-oriented strategies, we also have that really coming into sharp contrast with increasing globalization. And nothing demonstrated that better than the pandemic. The workforce, pathogens and behavior all move around the globe. So the idea that we can live within national silos and create health systems within those silos without acknowledging the pathogens of people and behaviors and trends will move between those silos is short-sighted globalization continues apace. Um, we're also seeing very significant financing shifts, both directly within health systems, but also related to health systems. So let me pause briefly and, and just mention what I mean by directly in health systems. In low and middle income countries, there is a shift globally, and there is strong political buy-in move towards universal health coverage, healthcare, or at least a minimum basic package of healthcare that is free of the point of use. And that is because of an acknowledgement that market-led systems in these countries, in low and middle income countries predominantly, have not served the majority of the population. And that has left most countries vulnerable, falling behind in terms of um, in terms of progress, progress, in terms of reducing burdens of disease, and in terms actually of, of economic growth, because we can't grow if we aren't well enough to work, and we can't be well enough to work if we aren't well enough to live and enjoy our lives. So those financing shifts in low and middle income countries are health specific, but of course they're happening within a context at the moment of very significant economic shocks. The world is recovering from the pandemic, we're seeing inflation, possibly very high rates of inflation on the horizon. We're seeing, as Nora has already flagged, increasing nationalization, cuts to overseas development assistance, cuts to international donor flows are affecting low and middle income countries as higher income countries try to tighten their belts and try to see to their own first. It, 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 it sounds like a sensible ideology, but within those nations are, are, are false silos. Our own isn't something that just exists within our streets. So I'll, I'll come back to that. Thirdly, I wanted to flag uh, workforce challenges. Now, workforce challenges are partly being driven by the first two trends I've, I've mentioned. Globalization is enabling the workforce to move more smoothly around the world, to move to where um, the, work, the health work offering is better. Uh, and where lives are more easily lived with families. Um, but also financing shifts. As the cost of living increases, people will be forced to seek work elsewhere or to look for opportunities 
that may be more lucrative. And that may mean moving from the public sector to the private sector in those contexts where dual systems exist. So we've got workforce challenges as, as pressures on health workforce pushes the numbers of people in health work down. In high income countries post pandemic, we've also got great retirement. So we've lost a lot of senior health workers and some of our most experienced people who frankly have burned out. You know, we put an enormous amount of pressure on people, very little reward. And now post pandemic, we're saying, great, now let's clear the backlog that accumulated over the last two years. So no thanks, don't take a breath, just keep going. So that's within that workforce. There are also much longer term trends that are putting the health workforce under pressure. And the key one of that is population aging. And that's a well-known phenomenon in higher income countries in Western Europe, Northern Europe. We do understand that populations are aging and that's been a challenge for some time now. But that is also becoming true in middle and upper middle income countries where they still have the challenges of a large young population but that young population is living longer and having more complex illnesses. And with that comes another set of workforce challenges as they deal with both communicable and non-communicable disease burdens and populations age. So those workforce challenges are going to require us to think really carefully and innovatively about how we distribute the workforce around the globe, how we distribute the health workforce within countries, how we meet patients' needs, but how we remember that the workforce is a collection of people, our people, your people. They are people whom we need to value, motivate, and remain engaged. So those are key workforce challenges. And then, as I've already hinted at in my previous point, we're seeing intersectoral health as a new challenge. So as populations age, and we see increasing rates of dementia, for instance, we, and, and uh, diabetes and ischemic heart disease, we start to need to think more about health production as part of healthcare. So what should we be doing all the way along the life course to reduce health needs in those final stages? What should we be doing within communities, homes, or narrower societies to support the production of health, both in the young and in the elderly, possibly outside of the healthcare sector. So we need to take a slightly different view of health where it's not only a vaccine, although vaccines work, um, but it is also about trying to think about health production, illness prevention, uh, the, the improvement of quality of life that we're all experiencing, and to do that within a systems perspective that understands that primary, secondary and tertiary healthcare isn't some total of our health system. Our communities and societies are too. So that's our intersectoral health trend. And finally, again, something I've touched on, economic volatility. Rising food prices, rising inflation, um, and the sort of heating up the global economy at the moment is just one of our current pressures. The last two years, we had stagnation of the global economy. So we've seen a downward bounce. We're now seeing a really rapid upward bounce. And we don't know what will come next. Our, our lessons from certainly in the United Kingdom, from post First World War 1920s recession, and uh, from the 1970s, when we also saw rapidly rising inflation and prices, we can't transfer very many lessons from those two past experiences into the current trend because of the degree of uncertainty that's facing the globe now, because we are in an unprecedented, interconnected world in a way that we were not in the 1920s, we're not in the 1970s, and we are in 2022. So our future trends, increasing globalization, financing shifts, that are trying to prioritize some basic health service provision that's free at the point of use. While, and that is happening in a context of donor cuts, funding cuts, and scarcity. We're looking at workforce challenges, both because of demographic change and workforce movement. We're looking at intersectoral health instead of healthcare as health service. And we're looking at economic volatility 
which is going to place at risk not only health systems, but the societies in which those systems operate. So those are our five future trends. I'm gonna pause now and move on to what I see as the opportunities that we could be grasping now. And now really is the time, because as Nora has already said, we've long had commitments first to the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. They focused the world's mind on what our priorities need to be. We made good progress on the Millennium Development Goals. We've made slow and faltering progress on the Sustainable Development Goals. But the pandemic and its impacts have really focused our minds on the most vulnerable for the time being. We are aware of the fact that the impact of the epidemic was not equally spread. Excess deaths were not equal amongst countries and were not equal amongst population groups within countries. We know now that protecting the most vulnerable across a broad definition of a health system is an investment for the future. It's an investment in protection against future pandemics. It's also an investment in the productivity of our future communities and our future economies. It isn't a cost. It's absolutely an imperative. And because of that, we need to put equity at the heart of global health systems, partly because equity is a view of how many and who is being left behind, partly because having unequal societies and unequal health systems actually costs lives. The most unequal systems in the world cost lives. They have lower life expectancies. So inequity costs not only in health terms, but in economic terms. It also costs in stability terms, it costs in social cohesion terms. And as most of Europe and the wealthy world starts to move towards measuring well-being and life satisfaction as the ultimate goals of human existence, we've learned that well-being and life satisfaction are always lowest in the most inequitable parts of the world. So we value this as society, we value this as humans, and we value it for good reason. Because we genuinely are all in this together. And the pandemic has proved that, but it is concerning that the pandemic seems to have generated a, a closing up of the ranks. Um, and uh, one of my, my favorite references is to something called insiders outsiders theory, which talks to the fact that when in times of plenty, our definition of who is inside our circle of trust, our circle of provision, uh, is much broader. We have plenty, we are willing to share, we are willing to consider many more people insiders to our system. In times of scarcity, we shrink that circle of insiders and we put many more people outside our circle of care. And I'd like to end by saying that we do that at our peril. We really do, especially when it comes to global health systems and the futures that we face as we continue to co combat communicable diseases, we increasingly combat non-communicable diseases, and we look to a globe in which the well-being of all is maximized, as well as just how long people live. Uh, and I think on that note, I'm going to end. Thank you. That's great, very timely. Thank you, Julie. Okay, so just a reminder to those people on this uh, webinar that if you go to your internet and you type in Slido, so that's S L I dot D O, um, and then hashtag um, UCL trial, you can uh, ask questions on Slido. So please do that. So I've got several questions already. So it's very interesting perspectives on global healthcare systems. So one, uh, Katie, this is the UCL East um, campus uh, series. Um, so I wonder if you could each tell us what is actually going to happen on UCL East. We were just uh, ranked last year first in, in the country for research on um, healthcare, medicine and life sciences. So what exciting new activities perhaps will we see when we move to um, the Olympic Park with the opening of two buildings? in addition to the Bloomsbury and other sites? Well, uh, I'll take that question and uh, just talk a little bit uh, about the Global Business School for Health. And, and I think, you know, it, it 
it really sits in a really interesting and exciting space. It, it's on that intersection between business and, and health and healthcare. And I think that you know, what we're gonna see uh, is uh, some, you know, of course, training, education, really you know, building the, the kind of programs and degrees. So we've got you know, biotech and pharmaceutical management at the master's level, digital health and entrepreneurship, and, and of course, global health care management. Um, and an important part of that is it's got three kind of streams and one is around healthcare finance, which of course has just been very important to the conversation we've had. Um, also health analytics and then leadership, which is, is an imperative. And, and then we've got, of course, uh, our flagship program, which is our MBA, which is a, a real integrated program for those leaders and decision makers. And I think all of that's really important and that that also is reflected in our research agenda as we move forward. We're, we're looking at really key areas around you know, the finances and operation of healthcare. But again, we're a global business group for health. So it'll be really, front and center is, is that global context, um, you know, strategy and, and health policy. And, and again, very important to the conversation that we've just had. And then, you know, last but not least, as Jolene, uh, you know, really effectively articulated is the workforce challenges. So I think, you know, all of those and East London, as, uh, you know, some of you may know, was particularly hard hit by the pandemic. And, and, and many of that was because of the kind of social inequalities uh, that, that exist across London and different areas. Um, you know, many early on in the lockdown, three boroughs in East London were particularly hit with high levels of death and, and subsequently long COVID. So for, for us as the Global Business School of Health, we see East London not just as our kind of living laboratory in which we can engage and, and undertake research, but really hopefully have a, an impact, um, you know, both in terms of our local, uh, because as we, I think made very clear uh, through both myself and Jolene, it's, it's really the, the local, the national and the global, and it's all got to work together. You know, we, we can't achieve those sustainability sustainable development goals by just focusing at, at, at one level. It's, it's got to be really a coordinated. And, and then moreover, it's got to be coordinated with all the stakeholders. So, so as I mentioned, I think we, we put a lot of responsibility on the WHO in an era where it really has struggles to be effective. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, for, again, political reasons, it often gets you know, uh, called out in ways uh, that are inappropriate because it, it again sits in that kind of wider geopolitical landscape. Um, but I think it's also bringing all the actors, all the stakeholders, all the voices that make up this and particularly citizens and patients because we can make a difference and we've got to be more vocal about the importance uh, of health and healthcare not just in our own background and, and area, but, but at, at that global level, um, again, as, as Jolene articulated, you know, thinking about those middle and low income countries. That's great, thank you. And Jolene, your thoughts on the new campus? Absolutely. Well, I think um, Nora said everything that, that could be said about UCL East itself, but I'll just add that UCL also came first in the country for economics. So, uh, and, and the beauty of London, as a city, it's incredibly well connected. So UCL East isn't sitting on an island. It's very well connected to every other part of UCL's campus. So what we've got is a body that's grown. We don't have two separate bodies. We have one with this fantastically connected network with new opportunities on the eastern side of the campus and on the western side of the campus in Bloomsbury. We've got, you know, the, the nation's top economics faculties, health. We've also got UCLH, you know, a, a, a learning hospital. So I think that's pretty important. And I, I bring the economics partly in because one of the biggest challenges of WHO is their chronic underfunding. 
and the role of new philanthropists like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who are filling that vacuum and we need to really think quite carefully using the resources of the laws at UCL, using our politics faculty at UCL. We need to really think through what the implications are of that shifting landscape. And the Global Business School for Health is extremely well positioned on the eastern side of our campus to draw in all of those experts and expertise. So that's it for me, thank you. That's great, yes, congratulations to economics. I mean, it's fantastic to have a fully rounded, comprehensive university. We are we are London's global university, I think is the strap line. So as well as her head of the game with medicine and, and health. Okay, another question. Um, you know, it is a state of the arts, art campus at UCL East and public engagement is one of the key ethoses of the design. So I wonder if you could tell us something, how people can physically uh, become engaged with what's happening there when it opens up in September. Well, I think from the, the Global Business School for Health's perspective, what we see as really distinctive and, and important for us is, is that engagement. So we have lots of ways that organizations and individuals can engage with us. Um, so on all our master's programs, including our MBA, students work on projects that are real world projects, as it were, you know, experiential learning where they have um, industrial mentors. Um, and those are defined in the, the widest sense of the world. Um, and, and the same thing uh, on our MBA, we have uh, health consultancy projects where, uh, you know, charities, um, you know, health organizations, um, NHS Trust can, um, you know, ask to uh, have MBA students, you know, help to work uh, on, on projects. So that's in addition, of course, to our academics who are, are also engaged in lots of different projects and want to, you know, really uh, partner with, with our community. Uh, you know, we, we recognize we're in Newham and, uh, you know, there, there's also uh, different NHS trusts there. And so that'll be an important part of our kind of outreach and, and engagement, uh, as well as with schools. And, and there'll be, um, throughout the year, we will have uh, public lectures, uh, some like this online, but we'll also have the, the great benefit of actually having, uh, you know, uh, a, a wonderful, you know, uh, lecture theater and, and place in which we can congregate and bring people together to really um, hear, hear the thought leaders, both within UCL, uh, but, but that wider community as well. So I, I think it's um, fantastic. And, and, and as I said, I can't emphasize enough that in terms of, of how we've designed the school and, and our vision for the school is really about engagement. So anyone out there who's looking for uh, a partner to collaborate in any of this space, you know, please do reach out to us. Great, I have a question from Edison. Um, he's asking, uh, to meet these global health challenges, should national governments be more assertive in regulating global health markets, including changes in intellectual property laws? Julian, would you like to have a go at that one? Oh, I'll have a go at that one. I'm gonna show my politics now. Um, yes, is the short answer. Um, a number of countries around the world have had a go at experimenting with unregulated free market, for want of a better word, neoclassical style healthcare markets with very little government intervention. And the result has been very expensive systems that yield very little health gains and are highly inequitable. And, and this was predictable because healthcare is um, it's called a derived good. We, we actually want health. We can't buy health. We have to buy health care. So we, you know, we're, we're taking that step over. Um, but also because we, we can't buy it, it, that good ourselves, we have to rely on an agent like a doctor or a nurse or an advisor. And so that means we're, we're making decisions with, with only half the information set that we would. And we're really bad judges of what our own health and what is good for our own health, actually. And we tend to judge what good healthcare is on the basis of superficial aspects, like, like hoteling, like how nice a, a GP surgery looks, or how many times you're tested, or how many drugs or prescriptions you get given. And those often do not correlate at all with health outcomes. 
but they do correlate with how expensive a health system is. So yes, we need governments involved. We also know that healthcare has, good healthcare has what's called positive externalities, wider societal benefits. So it doesn't benefit people to leave it all to the market and those who can afford it. Um, so we do need some intervention. As far as property rights are concerned, um, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I'm going to say that that's not my field and I don't want to upset the lawyers amongst us. But what I would say is what we need is a functioning publicly funded healthcare system that ensures a sufficient social safety net for all. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. A uh, second question uh, here. Um, how do you make global health systems more resilient to moving away from reliance on external help? Who would like to take that? So I'll, I'll be happy to take that. I, I, I think it's, uh, it's kind of a loaded question in a way, because I think, uh, you know, again, it gets back to that kind of go it alone sovereign. Um, and I think that that's my, from my perspective, that's misguided. We, we don't need a, a world of uh, autarky where everybody's trying to you know, do it alone. We, we need a world where we cooperate and, and collaborate and um, maximize our collective interests. So yes, we need resilient health systems and we, we need them to be effective at different levels. But I don't think the, uh, a resilient health system is one that doesn't collaborate. So North I, Korea I, is an example, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I think for me, um, it, yes, it, it's about working across, figuring out what best practice is. You know, we, we, we have, you know, all sorts of nuances in health systems. And um, so there's so much that we can learn by collaborating and working together. Uh, and so I would say for me that that is, should be, an effective, resilient health system is one that um, can bring the best from, from around the world by collaborating, which knows where its strengths lies, but also recognizes where its weaknesses are and, and is, is constantly looking to ways in which it can engage to improve those. Anything to add, Jolene? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll happily come in on a, on a slightly more technical point then to add to Nora's uh, points with, with which I wholeheartedly agree. Um, we also live in a world of uh, increasing ease in the collection of data, which makes it much easier for countries to know and understand where the majority of their disease burden is, is being caused, what are the interventions that can most cost effectively bring that disease burden down, and what is the total cost budget envelope required to fund that package of services to address those high burden illnesses. So, the, and there are numerous tools, you know, UCL has been involved in the development of allocative efficiency tools that are free for use. Uh, we're involved in rolling them out in Liberia at the moment, but we've been involved in many other countries, Afghanistan, Zimbabwe, and other organizations are doing the same thing. WHO is another leader in this space, trying to help countries figure out how to get the best bang for their buck, how to deliver a basic package of health services that does address the highest burden of disease and to do so sustainably because we have data. You can plan forward. You know what's happening in a population. You know what the disease trends are. And that's where the role of something like a business school for health is. It increases the capacity of decision leaders to take those decisions using the data and the models and the methods available. Great, thank you. So very local question. I think we have imminently a review coming out in the UK, the Messenger Review. Uh, so Nora, would you like to talk about that? Yeah, I think the, the, the Messenger Review is something that the government commissioned a while back to really look at the, the kind of leadership and management of the NHS. And uh, I think, you know, it's, it's about really understanding I think the, the culture of, of the NHS, how can we be more effective? Uh, so, I mean, I, I think it's welcomed. I think that there's an opportunity 
for us, particularly as a global business school for health to be a critical friend and, and to really help uh, you know, uh, with, with adding some of those insights. I think like in all health systems uh, and, and particularly I think in Europe and in the UK and places like the United States, we see a, a lot of questions around management and leadership and we see them as, as more important than ever before because we can't just keep you know, trying to train up clinicians um, and think that that can solve our, our health problems uh, or, or needs and, and particularly from a workforce perspective. So it is really, how do we, we train leaders? How do we create courageous leaders, decisive leaders, ones that can actually um, not just embed technology. We hear a lot about innovation and technology, but really inspire their staff, manage their staff, um, ensure that they're getting the, the, the best in terms of quality, diversity, and inclusiveness. And, and I think sometimes that's where um, health organizations, um, you know, are so driven and focused sometimes on the technical and delivering those health services that they miss out on a lot of those really, what I'd call, uh, and I think Jolene just said it a minute ago, the human side. We are dealing with humans and, and, and to really, uh, one of the things that, you know, we, we've all uh, noted, uh, you know, is of course, women make up in lots of health systems and globally, the, the bulk of the workforce. And yet they're often not the decision makers. They, they make up a, a small fraction globally. And even in, in um, you know, the global North, as it were, you know, places like the UK and the United States, they make up about 20%, but 80% of the workforce. So there's definitely room here, I think, for creating a more inclusive, uh, and, and diverse uh, workforce at, and, and making sure it's at all levels. And I think that's a challenge. And I think that that'll be something that, that the messenger review most likely will highlight because I think it's a, a challenge here in the NHS as well. Thank you. And another question, do you have any sort of specific examples when we talk about healthcare systems globally? We also need to talk specifically, I guess, about mental health and social care. So any ongoing projects you'd like to discuss, Jolene, perhaps? I'm very happy to. Uh, we, um, we do numerous trials of community-based interventions that rely very little on healthcare or healthcare providers as we would traditionally think of them. So that's the low-income low context where even things like um, maternal and child health, early childhood nutrition, has to be delivered in the home. It tends, tends to be supported outside of a healthcare setting. And that requires really thinking much more innovatively about who is the health workforce, who is supporting these behaviors, who is supporting these patients uh, and this population need. So that's the first. In high income countries, of course, there is a very important conversation going on at the moment about mental health, uh, both in the young and in the elderly and social care particularly for the elderly, but of course it cuts across populations. We really need to start thinking about health as a system. I was really pleased to see that the, the headline for today's session was about health systems, but I have no illusions that people would have read healthcare as they read health systems. Health systems are not clinics, doctors, hospitals. Health systems are communities, households, patients, and those healthcare providers. And it all takes place within a wider economic environment. And that's why actually in, in, in most of what today, I've kept alluding to the political, the economic, the social context in which this all takes place. Uh, so yep, we've got a lot of um, work going on on community led work. Uh, I actually think, I think we need, we need to go back to the drawing board about integrating social care. We need to relook at our budgets. Uh, in the United Kingdom, we look at the budget allocation to mental health services. We need to think about how we are training and attracting providers into mental health care and into social care, because we've got a staffing shortage in both. Uh, and, and these are real challenges. And, and unfortunately, none of the work we've got ongoing at the moment is sufficiently well funded to offer real solutions to that yet. So this is a, a, a call to action. We, we need more. 
Thank you. There's a further question here specifically directed to you, Nora, about GBSH and how we link research and teaching with what's already going on um, in UCL. So it's a brand new business school and how do we ensure there are complementarities uh, with the rest of well, UCL? Well, I, I think one of the most exciting things about GBSH is its interdisciplinary uh, staff and, and, and nature. So one of the things that I'm really committed to and, and, and I know my colleagues are, is uh, we don't see ourselves as, as an isolated department. Uh, and we, we see ourselves a, as, as a group of individuals from lots of different backgrounds, because if we're gonna solve some of these challenges that we've talked about, and I think, you know, just as, as Jocelyn has just articulated the whole kind of dilemma for social care and, and that wider context in which it sits in, you can't solve that with one discipline. You need a, a real cross-disciplinary group of individuals. Um, and the, the exciting thing about GBSH is that we, we see ourselves, uh, you know, we sit in the faculty of population health. Uh, so we've got lots of institutes, uh, you know, Jolene sits in the Institute of Global Health, which of course is, is our colleagues and, and we, we can tap into there and we've got you know, uh, other institutes, the Institute of Clinical Trials, the Institute of Health Informatics. And so we see ourselves as really being able to, you know, start to think about these and to start to shape some of these questions, um, but we will not solve them alone. We will solve them by really working with our colleagues across UCL. And I think what I believe for, for, for us as, as a group, as a department, because we are so diverse, and, and when I say we're diverse, we, we've got people from lots of different kinds of backgrounds coming together to think about um, health and healthcare management in its, its broader sense. And so they have natural links to other parts of UCL. And, and that allows us then to pull colleagues in um, and, and really have a, a much richer kind of conversation. Uh, and, and I think that will be really one of the strengths of, of GBSA. Thank you very much. Yeah, I know I'm chairing this, but we did have a research day yesterday, didn't we? And we had people from economics and other departments and uh, very interdisciplinarity is, is in the DNA and teaching is research underpinned and students are, you know, our researchers, we see that very strongly ourselves. So we look forward to collaborating Okay, so finally, a question to each of you really is just to sum up your key message if you wanted to get something across to the head of the WHO or key, key actors in global healthcare systems or philanthropists, uh, what key call to action relating to global healthcare systems and our plans for the UCL East campus uh, would you like to convey? Jolene. Yeah, why don't I go ahead so Nora can have the last word. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm going to really go back to the opportunities that I outlined in my presentation. The call to action is to put equity and, and, the, and the target of health equity at the heart of, of the future of global health systems. So if, if that's what our, our future health system, systems are aiming to achieve, the equity of health both within countries and between countries, then we'll be on the right track because what that will, will focus our minds on will be the most important interventions and strategies. But I would also say that we need to think about health systems outside of health care. So those will be my, my two take home messages, thanks. Yeah, and I, I, I would echo that. I, I think those are, are you know, absolutely spot on points. And I would just say that from my, my point uh, and, and my view, and, and what I'd really like the takeaway to be is that, A, we cannot make the uh, World Health Organization the scapegoat for all the things that didn't go right in, in the pandemic. And we all have to take collective responsibility for health and healthcare, um, however we want to see those. And, and we cannot lose focus that it has to be through collaboration, through cooperation at a global level. It, it really, cannot be left. You, no country can solve these you know, challenges, problems, whatever you want to call them by themselves. 
So I think this is a very misguided kind of perspective and I would not want anyone, anyone to come and think that the lesson from the pandemic was that, you know, we've got to go it alone. We've got to try to um, do more alone. And I think um, it worries me uh, very much now as I see countries start to redirect resources, even economic resources towards, um, you know, much more um, auto, auto, you know, autarky and, 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 you know, trying to build things up themselves rather than working cooperatively because there is just the challenges that face us and will continue to face us need collectivity. They need communitarianism. And that needs to be across all those different stakeholders that we've discussed, um, working together to really uh, you know, ensure the well-being uh, of humanity. So thank you. That's great. Thank you very much both for very interesting insights and uh, for the audience questions. And we look forward to working with you and you, our audience coming to our UCL East campus and our other campuses. So next Tuesday, there will be another lecture in this series, and that is entitled, What Role Do Local Communities Play in Research? So it will be very interesting to follow up on that. So thank you very much again, everyone, for your time and your insights, and we look forward to continuing our collaborations and networking.